Amen. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, worship team, for leading us in those songs, those prayers of, of worship to our great God. We uh, live in a culture that highly values personal convenience, right? We'll make it easy, make it quick, or I'm not really interested in it. Um, I mean, let's just look at the use of the microwave, right? And we all have them. We all have them in our homes. And it's, you know, you got a piece of meat. It's like, do you want to grill that or do you want to put it in the oven and let it, you know, sit there for a while and really get cooked? Like, nah, let's just nuke it for two minutes and call it good. Put it in the microwave. Let's just eat it. Uh, and and, and uh, reports have come out that some people love the live stream that their church produces because it means that they don't have to attend in-person gatherings simply because they don't want to put on pants. That's what studies have shown. There's, just, there's some people that are just like, yeah, I just like my church, love being with those people, but man, pulling up my pants, it's a hard, hard task. Uh, and, then, and then the worst of our culture when it comes to these personal conveniences is the projector alarm clock. And I'm, if you have it, please don't identify yourself because I'm making fun of it right now. But it's, 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 it's as if turning your head sideways on a pillow is so much of an inconvenience you had to project it onto the ceiling, so the second you open your eyes, you have to do nothing else but literally just open your eyes, uh, because we all know turning our head to the side is so inconvenient. Uh, th- this personal, convenient culture, if we look at it truly, we start to see that it's really self-centered. Uh, it's about me. Make it easy for me. I don't want to be bothered with things that don't pertain to me. Make sure my life gets convenient, more convenient through this. I want my life to be better. Uh, it's this me world. In fact, here in America, we actually have a model that we say out loud to people, and it's called, I'm looking out for number one. Watching out. You got to look out for number one. Make sure you're watching out for number one. Uh, and when this personal convenience and self-centered philosophy leaks into the church, we begin to have major problems. When the thought of do what is best for me, don't, don't ask me to, to give up some kind of right for somebody else and betterment, uh, creeps into Christianity, we have major problems because it goes against what Christ is actually asking us to do as representations of him. It goes against Uh, Christ's way of living just goes against what our culture presents as good. And depending how much of this American philosophy of look out for number one has polluted your mind, and because if we're honest, for all of us, it has to some degree or another. These last sermons, and today's sermon especially, will be hard for you to swallow um, and agree with. The types of sacrificial living that scripture is calling us to do as Christians, which demonstrates, we see demonstrated in Romans 14 and the beginning of 15, and many places elsewhere in scripture, will sound very foreign to you and just not right. So my encouragement before we dive into our passage this morning is for you to ask God to renew your minds so that you don't follow the patterns of this world, but you're transformed by the renewing of your mind so you may know what God's will is for you this morning when it comes to living in unity with other Christians around you. Um, that's exactly what Romans 12 talks about, is that God needs to remo- renew our minds so we don't think the same way the world thinks. And so I'll give you a moment and just with the Holy Spirit, ask the Holy Spirit Reveal truth to me. If there's any kind of barriers that's keeping me from uh, hearing what you have for me through the reading and the the preaching of Scripture, would you take those barriers down so I can receive today and know how to live, how you want me to live as the Spirit that guides me. So take a moment, have a conversation with the Holy Spirit, and then we'll jump into our passage. God, we're asking you to, through your Holy Spirit, help this passage of Romans 15 to sink deep into our hearts, that we may know truth and live it out. 
Help us to be the church that you desire, not just people that talk about the things of God, but actually strive through the help and strength and power of your spirit to live these out. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles or your uh, mobile devices, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 15. We're going to be working through seven verses this morning, Romans uh, chapter 15, 1 through 7. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through the endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live with such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. These seven verses, we have the privilege of having in our own language right here in front of us, that we have the privilege of opening up our personal Bibles that we have with us and studying together. Let's not take that for granted or take Scripture lightly, but to recognize the true gift we have of having God's words with us this morning to actually look at. Kids, I'm glad you you guys are with us. We really believe in family worship here. This sermon, you can get stuff out of. You can grow from Romans chapter 15. To help you pay attention and to help you track along, we have have a word tracker for you this morning. If you have the half sheet bulletin, uh, it's already marked out for you with two squares. One square has the word gospel in it. The other square has the word unity. If you don't have a bulletin, that's okay. You can just grab a random piece of paper and rob your mom's pen and write down gospel and unity and then every time I say the word gospel put a little check mark by gospel and every time I say the word unity put a little check mark by unity adults if you have a trouble with focusing you can do the same thing Uh, and then after the sermon I'd love to hear how many times they say gospel and unity and we're going to start right now so every time I say gospel, oh, that's gospel. Oh, there's two. So mark, mark those down, all right? And every time I say unity, oh, there's one for unity. Oh, there's twice for unity. You mark it down, okay? All right, here we go. Now, when you look at Romans 14 and 15 relationship with each other, really 14 should extend into the first seven verses of 15. Uh, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but the chapters and verses that are in your Bible, the markings there, uh, they were added later in time uh, than what the original manuscripts had. They were added as man-made identifiers, and I, and I appreciate them. They help us find passages, but they're not inspired by God where those uh, passages are identified as chapters and verses. So uh, in my opinion, as I read through 14, it should extend seven more verses before the chapter 15 starts because there's clearly not a dividing of thought between 14 and 15. Um, So all that to say that the topic we're on this morning is still the Christian conscience, Christian opinions, and how the church has unity in spite of those different opinions, and how a Christian should live next to another Christian who sees how to live something out differently. Um, This this will be our uh, this will be our fourth sermon, and this will be the final uh, sermon in on on the topic of Christian conscience. But before we dive in, I want to just remind you, in case you're new here or you just need reminded of what we've talked about in the chapter 14, I want to remind you of four things uh, that we have learned journeying through Romans 14. The first thing is that there are some things, this is number one, that are inherently, or are not inherently sinful. But if your conscience condemns it, then it becomes sinful to you specifically. For you... Going against your conscience is wrong, and you should not violate your conscience. And God may be asking you to have this matter of conscience for your own good and for your own protection. Number two, 
The second thing we've learned so far, your conscience cannot override the clear teaching of Scripture. So when the Bible gives clear instruction, you cannot make it a matter of your conscience. Number three, matters of conscience and opinion should not divide us as a church. We should not be judging each other, despising each other. Um, these are things that should not divide us, or the, there are things, sorry, that should divide us, but they're not matters of conscience. Essential scripture teachings, unrepented sin, um, those things should re, to divide us as a congregation, but not matters of conscience. And lastly, number four, those who have the more free conscience on an issue needs to be the one who accommodates for the stricter conscience. We should be concerned about causing a brother or sister to stumble. So when we are with them, we need to refrain from some of the freedoms we feel we have. And remember that for all of us, for each issue, there are some issues we fall more stricter and more freer on that particular issue of conscience. But when you find yourself with a more free conscience, you are under the obligation to give up your freedoms in that moment to live in unity with your brother or sister. All right, so those are, we've learned lots more than four, but those are the four things I want to remind you of this morning before we dive into our passage. So let's go ahead as we wrap up this, this teaching of Paul on unity pertaining to the Christian opinion. Let's go ahead and start with verse 1 of chapter 15. Paul says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the, feel, the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So here we see Paul using the term strong and weak. Strong meaning those who are experiencing more freedom on an issue and weak for those who are feeling more restricted by conscience. And what I find extremely interesting in this passage is that Paul is not trying to challenge the weak not to be weak anymore. Isn't that interesting? Like you would think that if Paul calls somebody weak, he would then, his next teaching would be, now here's how you are not, or how do you become unweak, how to become strong. This is how you fix the fact that you're weak in this area. But he's not doing that. It's like he's just assuming that anytime a group of Christians get together, they're never going to agree on all the issues. And there are always going to be some who fall in a weaker category, in a more strict and, and fail to see their freedoms in that specific area. There's always going to be other Christians who see the freedoms. It's like Paul's making this assumption that every time Christians gather together, there's always going to be strong and weak when it comes to matters of opinion and conscience. And it's not something we should try to fix. It's, just an, it's like we have to learn how to work with it. It's nothing that we can really fix. To try to all get on the same page on every issue sounds ridiculous to Paul. If you grew up in a Christian, conservative Christian home, you probably have your own story of how weird it can get if a church is built on one person's conscience. Nod your head if you kind of know where I'm going with that. Um, where a church leader suddenly just decides that what his conscience is telling him is what everybody in the church must believe and do. Uh, where, where churches are saying, like, no one's allowed to watch TV. No one. You can't. If you're going to be a part of this church, you cannot watch TV. And, of course, people are scratching their heads saying, where in the Bible does it say that? And it gets really weird, too, when, when churches make rules like, you, you, can't have, you can't have purple curtains. You can have brown curtains, that's okay, but you can't have purple curtains if you want to come to this church. And not only does it get weird, but it also gets wrong because churches start to divide over specifically what Paul's saying churches shouldn't divide over, which is matters of opinions and conscience. Now, I know this is a little touchy, but I just wanted to be honest with you. Uh, I grew up in a home where I was told at a young age that rock music, music with drums and beats and stuff like that, was wrong. And I grew up in a home where my parents told me drinking alcohol was a sin. And when I started, when I got old enough, about 12, 13, when I started reading the Bible for myself, I began to actually lose confidence in my parents' faith. Because I started recognizing that things that my parents were calling sin weren't actually talked about in the Bible as sin. And I started really struggling in my faith, not knowing what to do with what I thought was sin is no longer sin, according to Scripture. And it would have been fine for my parents 
to say, we have a conscience against rock music and against alcohol. When you live with us, we won't be participating in those things because of our conscience. And that would have been good of my parents to do that and right of my parents to do that. They crossed the line when they started calling it sin. Now, to give my parents credit, later in my teenage years as God was kind of working on them and some of, and some of the stuff they were uh, kind of renewing their minds, uh, they came back to us as kids and they apologized and they made it right and they did just a great job of um, helping us to see the difference between sin and areas of conscience. But we should just assume that if we live in a gospel-centered community, which is one of our seven core values, that we're going to be living in a very diverse group. Since it's the agreeing on the gospel that brings us together and not our opinions of Christian living issues. We should just assume that when you sit down with a group of Christians, it's going to be a diverse group on issues that aren't specifically mentioned and talked about in the Bible and how we live out our Christian faith. We are not isolated individuals. We're saved into a family, and we're meant to live in community as Christians. So selfishness is our enemy, one of our enemies. And thinking of others before ourselves is one of our goals of how we just have to live together in a Christian community. Note that in verse 1, Paul continues by counting himself as one of the strong on the issues he's using as the example. He's saying, we who are strong. So Paul's throwing himself into that category of being one of the strong. And when he's telling that the strong have to have the obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, he's telling himself that. I have to bear with the feelings of the weak. So he's getting the short end of the stick, and he's calling himself to lay down the freedoms when fellowshipping with others. So Paul is recognizing what he's asking those with freedom to do. For those who are strong, who feel more free, you have the obligation to the one who is weaker to go the extra mile in helping that person, in serving that person, in walking with that person, in welcoming that person, and loving that person so that they don't become offended or stumble in their conscience. How is this done? How do we do this? Paul addresses that in the last part of verse 1. He says, the way you do this is you don't live to please yourself. Don't please yourself. Live sacrificially for the good of others. Give up your own freedoms at times in order to make others around you feel loved and to feel welcomed, which is not going to settle well if we allow the American values of personal rights and conveniences to leak into our Christian worldview. Don't live to please yourself. As Americans, that sounds completely backwards. Don't live to please myself? It's called sacrificial living. It's something Christ calls us to. It actually reminds me a lot of bringing our first child home from the hospital. Um, and by the way, happy Mother's Day, everybody. This type of sacrificial love and caring for each other that Christ is calling us to in Romans 15 here is defined very well by the sacrificial love a mother gives her child. Nod your head if you agree with me crazy amount of sacrificial love and serving that a mother gives to her child. In fact, can we just give moms a round of applause for the way they sacrificially serve their children? If, if you know me, you know there's one thing I say to my mother on, on Mother's Day. I did text her this morning the same thing. Count your blessings, mom. I could have been a twin. So I, I texted that to her. It's my normal every year thing. Uh, but I remember bringing our first child home from the hospital, and it was a very refining moment for us. I thought I was a pretty unselfish person until I brought a child home from the hospital and recognized everything changed about my life. Um, a ton of freedoms are just gone. I remember having a conversation with Emily where I'm like, hey, let's go to the movie theater. You know, we'd be kind of stuck in the house with the baby for the last couple weeks. Let's go hit up a movie. And then she's like, well, what are you going to do with the baby? Oh, yeah. I guess I'll just go out and mow the lawn. I, it was weird. It was, it was hard for me. I remember feeling really torn. I'm like, I want to go see a movie, but I don't know what to do with the kid. 
The freedom, the freedom of sleeping is gone. You know this. It's out the window. Unless the baby sleeps, you aren't getting any kind of sleep. Whoever came up with the phrase, I was sleeping like a baby, comparing it to a good thing, uh, clearly has never had any kids. It's crazy. David, our, our, our oldest child, when we brought him home from the hospital, he was colicky, and he didn't sleep well. And I remember night after night taking shifts with Emily, 2 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, he's screaming and crying, and I'm doing laughs with him, patting him, trying to put him down. He stops. He, we put him down. We slowly walk away. Please, please don't cry. And then <laughs> start the whole process again of trying to get that kid to sleep. Emily and I had to learn not to live to please ourselves, but to bear with the failings of this weaker human known as our little David. Now, now for those of you out there who are worried about how my kids feel about being a sermon illustration, uh, they love it. Uh, because I told them that every time that I mentioned them in a sermon illustration, they get a dollar. Uh, I, I grew up as a pastor's kid, and being used in sermons, I, I just hated it. Uh, especially when my dad was trying to illustrate sin. It felt like he always used my life as an example to illustrate sin. And uh, anyway, so I didn't want to put my kids through the same torture I had growing up. So I told my kids, if I use you in a sermon illustration, I will pay you the copyrights of, of that illustration. So David, I, I owe you a dollar. So how do we deal with the failings of the weak? a.k.a. those who have very strict opinions of non-essential issues. How do we give up our freedoms and don't please ourselves when it's so ingrained in us? How do we give up freedoms and accommodate to people and bear with their weaknesses at our expense when we're around them? Well, Paul goes even one step further and says... Don't just live in a way that doesn't offend the weaker conscience, but you go the extra mile and actually look for ways of doing good to those around you and build them up. Let's look at verse 2. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Paul is saying that we need to go further than just not making them feel guilty with being weaker in that area, but we need to encourage them not to go against their conscience. We need to look for ways of building them up, look for ways of admiring them. Many people who are weak in understanding are also new in faith. Like they're a baby Christian, and they need encouragement and growing as they understand the newfound freedoms they have in Christ. Paul is telling those who are stronger to encourage the weaker, for they don't know the reasons for why a person has a stricter conscience in, a, in that particular issue. I remember one time uh, leading worship at a church. In college, I had a band, and we were going around to different churches leading worship. We walked into this one um, church, and as we were setting up, the lead pastor walked in. He looked at our setup, and he said, no, that's not going to work. I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, uh, the drum set, not going to work. We don't do drums at this church. Uh, we think they are wrong for a church to have drums in it. And so we're like, okay, we took them down. And in our hearts, we were kind of like, oh, this, you know, this stinks. Why are we doing this? Like, how are we supposed to play without our drum set? Um, but God, you know, as we talked as a band, God started really working in our hearts of like, hey, we're here to serve the church. That's why we're here. If drums are offensive or somehow going to put a wall between us and the people we're trying to lead in worship that morning, of course we'll take the drum set down. Of course. And then we remember t I remember talking about even, like, how do we encourage this congregation? And, like, after uh, the, the congregation sound, sang louder than any congregation we led worship with this tour on. And when we were done, I remember just telling the pastor, like, I just want to encourage you. Like, your congregation sings so loud. And it's so encouraging. And uh, that's exactly what Paul's asking us to do here. Don't just tolerate, but actually look for ways of building up the person who has a stricter conscience in that area. Look for ways of admiring them. So we're going to try a pair share this morning. The pair share, by the way, if you're new to a pair share, pair share is just the person next to you you're going to have a 30-second conversation with. Um, it could be your child. It could be your spouse. It could be your best friend. It could be a stranger. Um, that's the person you're going to have a 30-second conversation with. But the, the pair share is, what could you say to build someone up in this situation? And I'll give you the situation. So you have a pool. It's a nice pool at your house. 
and you decide to invite another person, another family from your church, from our church here, to your house to swim in the pool for a pool party on, a, on an afternoon. Well, uh, the family tells you that they would love to come and they appreciate the invitation, but they also let you know that they don't think it's right for a Christian to wear a bathing suit. And so they're going to be showing up with a t-shirt and some gym shorts. You say, okay, you have a quick family, family discussion about it. You, of course, decide, thanks to Romans 14, you, of course, decide, well, let's, let's accommodate to the weaker conscience here, the stricter conscience. Let's say, hey, let's ourselves, let's not wear bathing suits for this pool party. For this one, we're going to wear gym shorts and t-shirts so we make sure there's nothing weird between us and, we're, and we make sure in no way we're making them stumble if they think they have a, if they have a conscience against a Christian wearing bathing attire. So... They come over, you have a great pool party together, it's a lot of fun, you really connect, there's some really good moments. After the pool party, you're sitting around eating some good barbecue, and you remember, oh yeah, Romans 15, I want to build them up. Here's your parachute. How, what are some things you could say to this family that you've invited over that would build them up and encourage them in the conscience they have not to wear bathing suits as a Christian? You guys with me? Situation set up well enough? All right, so turn to the person next to you, 30-second conversation. Give some examples of some things you could say to really encourage that family and build them up in that stricter conscience and go out loud with words. Some of you are struggling with this because you're still too excited that you have a pool in your backyard. <laughs> All right, very good. I hope you guys had some good discussion. I'll give you a few of my thoughts on it. Um, I mean, you could say, hey, we sure saved a lot of money on sunscreen for that pool party. Don't, nah, that was, no, don't say that one. That's not a good one. But, but you could say, hey, to the couple, you could say, thanks, thanks for sharing that conviction with us. Like, that's really kind of you and good of you to share like your convictions and let and i'd love to hear more about like why you have this conviction what is god doing in your heart maybe there's something i'm missing that i should know about when it comes to modesty and swimming uh another thing you say is just we had such a good time together thank you for coming over this was so much fun loved hanging out with you uh maybe another way of encouragement is like i'm glad that you take modesty ser seriously Thanks for like thinking deeply about modesty and really processing how a Christian should dress in this culture. And I can tell that you really want to honor God. And that's why you're doing this. And I, that, that encourages me and I want to encourage you in that. All right, so let's look again at verse 2. We see a word that Paul, Paul uses here called neighbor. So what, what appears by Paul using the word neighbor in verse 2 is that it appears that Paul is saying this principle of the strong serving the weak goes beyond church talk, goes beyond church community, and should be found in us as we relate to our neighbors and those around us. So this idea of the strong, a strong serving the weak should be bigger than just in a church community of Christian brothers working with Christian brothers and Christian sisters working with Christian sisters. It actually should be something that's found in our community because a neighbor is just explained or described as someone who's around us. A good example of this is, if you know Dan and Susan Gingrich, they were our missionaries for many years in North Africa, and Dan was telling me about how Susan, when she would go out, would wear the head covering scarf. Obviously, Susan didn't believe that was necessary to wear that for spiritual reasons, but she knew that if she would go out without it, it could somewhat be a wall, somewhat be offensive, somewhat be a, uh, something between that would separate her and the culture, the neighbors around her. So she would do it out of respect. And there's lots of missionaries that talk about that kind of sacrificial living. And it really should be a trademark for all of us as Christians. If you're strong in a certain area and you know a neighbor around you is weak in that area, you should use your strength to build them up. 
But this doesn't come naturally. Because in our culture, what we're used to is the strong being served by the weak, right? If you're strong, weak people do stuff for you. And when this personal convenience part of our, our culture sinks in and leaks into Christianity, it's really easy to say, like, wait a minute. It's not my problem that this person gets offended over that. It's not my problem that this person stumbles in that area. I'm the one who has more freedom and really sees what Scripture is saying on that issue. It's their problem. Why would I accommodate for their problem? If you feel that, you're feeling the cultural effect on you. When Christ is telling us to do something differently, where do we find the motivation to live sacrificially towards others when every part of us is saying, it's not my problem, it's their problem? Where do we find the motivation to live sacrificially? And that's what Paul answers in verse 3. Let's look at verse 3. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached on you or reproached you fell on me. There it is. Christ is the perfect example of sacrificially serving the weak to extend that he gave to the extent that he gave his life for them. Christ was willing to sacrifice for the good of others. Let's remember the gospel here. The center of all of us that holds this church together, that holds our lives together, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why should I give up my freedom for someone who feels more restricted than me? Because Christ did. And Christ is our example. Mark chapter 10, 45. You don't have to go there, but I want to read you the verse. It says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. Christ did not come to be served, but to serve others. He clearly demonstrated him being the strong, serving the failings of the weak. You also see here in verse 3 that Paul quotes scripture. He says, but as it is written, and he's quoting, if you want to know, he's quoting Psalm 69, verse 9. That's his quote. And their quote is, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Now, if you're not familiar with the word reproaches, it means insult. So what Paul's saying, he's quoting the scripture that says, so the insult of those who insulted you fell on me, meaning Jesus. What he's saying is Jesus was willing to be mocked. He was willing to be tortured. He was willing to be killed for the benefit of others. The perfect example of sacrifice is Jesus. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, you don't have to turn there, but I want to read you this verse. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Christ gave us so much wealth of his wealth, in our impoverished state, so that we could gain wealth. And again, we know that uh, Paul is, of course, talking about spiritual wealth here and salvation and the riches that it brings. But the point is, Christ gave up his riches so that we might have. Philippians chapter 2, very popular passage, um, verses 4 through 7 says, Let us let each of us look not to his own interest, but also the interest of others, having this mind among us, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself. Are you catching this? He was with God and did not count equality with God something to hold on to, and he let go. And emptied himself for our sakes. Where do you find the motivation to lay down your freedoms and conveniences for the sake of those who are weak and failing to see an issue with clarity? By recognizing that Christ has done the exact same thing for you. 
He accepted you. He loved you. He welcomed you. He became like you so that you and Christ could have unity and be together. You can only give people what you possess. And you only possess what you've been given. So if you fail to recognize what Christ has given you, it's going to be impossible for you to give what you don't possess. But when you realize what you've been given in Christ, when you recognize what Christ actually did for you, you then have the ability to extend it to those around you so they can experience Christ. That's why Paul's saying, look at the example of Christ here in verse 3. That should motivate you to do the same thing for others who may be weaker than you, and you are needing to accommodate to them. Paul continues in verse 4. Let's look at verse 4 together. For whatever was written in former days was, was written for our instruction, and through endurance and through encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So, Since Paul just quoted Psalm 69, verse 9, he's reminding the church here in Rome that Scripture is to be used to understand how we ought to live. Scripture is to be used to give us instructions. And Paul's saying, if we endure and don't grow weary of doing what's right, in the ways that Scripture encourages us to, we can have hope. what, what, What hope? What kind of hope is Paul talking about? Well, he's talking about the hope that unity is actually possible. Thanks to the work of Christ, if we endure and don't give up, and we use Scripture as our guide, as our encouragement for how to respond correctly to each other, this equals the hope that unity is actually possible. We can live unified together with other Christians. The definition of hope is just the desire of some good with expectation of obtaining it. If we hold tight to Scripture, Fairlawn, are you catching this? If we hold tight to Scripture, and if we keep enduring, not giving up when times are tough, and if we refuse to allow non-essential opinions to divide us, we can have hope of true gospel-centered community, and unity as a church, even though we differ on matters of conscience, even though we don't see eye to eye on everything. Paul is so excited about this hope and passionate about the church having unity that he breaks out in this prayer. So we're looking at 5 and 6. Verse 5 and 6, he breaks out in this prayer and he says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is offering this beautiful prayer, showing his heart for what he wants for the church in Rome and the church everywhere. And I strongly resonate with it for our church and I don't know if you strongly resonate with it or not but it's beautiful it's exactly what we're trying to accomplish as a church and we come together with one voice to glorify God living in harmony together having unity loving each other and after that beautiful prayer of five and six we come to our final verse verse seven Where Paul says, therefore, in other words, what Paul is saying, this is what I'm getting at. This is the main point. So think about all of chapter 14. Think about these first seven verses of chapter 15. And Paul is saying, this is it. This is the main point. This is what I've been getting at. He says in verse 7, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And that's it, church. There it is. That's the main point of these last four sermons. It's the main point of why Paul went into such detail of writing. Paul went into such detail, it took us these four sermons to unpack it because he kept talking and teaching to help his, the church in Rome and to help us today, inspired by the word of God, to live in unity. Paul deeply cares about unity in accordance with Christ because unity brings glory to God. 
It's how the world knows we are Christians, by the way that we love and care for each other. And guys, there's no greater purpose on earth, and there is nothing that should motivate us more than to bring glory to God. It's the purpose of everything we do. It's the reason we exist. Our creator, our king, the one who knows us, the one who loves us more than anyone else would receive glory and recognition and fame and celebration by the way that we live. But the fact of the matter is this. The church has hurt a lot of people. I'm talking about the broader church, but I'm also talking about us specifically as the Fairlawn Church. We've hurt a lot of people by people feeling judged when they walk in our doors, by people not feeling welcomed for who they are. When Christ has set a very different example of accepting, accepting one another as we come together for those who are willing to trust him. All you got to do is start talking to people in our community and really in any community and you'll start recognizing that a lot of people want nothing to do with God because they walked in the church and had a really bad experience. They maybe looked different, they maybe acted different, maybe smelled different, maybe they had different opinions on life issues. But they were sincerely trying to give God a chance. And walked away from the church very hurt by people's reactions of them. The opposite of welcome. More of like, I don't think people want me here. And maybe you're even sitting here saying, hey, I relate to that. I sometimes feel very unwanted at my home church. And Paul's trying to address this head on, saying we cannot divide over these non-essential issues. This is ridiculous. Unity brings glory to God. Disunity among believers, it's a disgrace to who God is. Now, I want to clarify again. I know we've clarified this several times, but I feel the need to one more time clarify something. There is a very dangerous and harmful way of misunderstanding the scriptures here. And, and that would be to forget that Paul is talking about unity in the middle of disagreements on opinions, not disagreements on clear biblical teaching. Paul mentions twice here in the last verses that we're unpacking that our unity is to be found um, in accordance with Christ or as Christ welcomes you. And we should all know that Christ did not and will not accept everyone who comes to him. I immediately think about Matthew chapter 7. I know this is getting really touchy, but Matthew chapter 7, I think it's verse 21, verse 22 where Jesus is talking about people who are going to come and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we? And say a list of spiritual things they did. And Jesus tells them, he says, away from me, you evildoers. You, you didn't know me. You weren't a part of me. And I also think about Matthew chapter 10, verse 33, where Jesus clearly states, whoever denies me before men, I will also deny them before my Father who is in heaven. So there are things that we should be divided about as a church. If there's unrepentant sin, that should be a problem. That should be a wall that puts us up with those people in our church. If there are people in our church who simply do not care about honoring God, do not care about the kingdom of God, that should be divisive. And we should not seek to live in harmony with those people. But if we as Christians desiring to honor God have different opinions of conscience and Christian living, we should be able to be unified in our worship and communal living by those who are more free in their conscience on that specific matter, giving up their freedoms as not to make the stricter conscience sin or stumble or feel unwelcomed. If we can't accept other believers in our church community because of our own opinions, it shows major ingratitude towards what Christ has done for you and how Christ has accepted you. We're going through harder times than normal. Normal struggles that we have gone through in the past, they've just been elevated these last, this last year. 
our unity is really being tested. And I know you know that. We've had those conversations. And it's probably not going to get any easier either. It's probably just going to get harder. And so the big question before us is will we stay unified in the gospel and our worship of Christ in the middle of cultural pressures, of opposition, in the middle of not seeing eye to eye on how to deal with the issues and the circumstances around us? That's the big question. And the answer to that question rests on every single person here or listening on the live stream. And how we welcome each other to live life together in the middle of disagreeing on opinions and circumstances. Whether we let that divide us or we say, that's okay. We can disagree. Now, there is hope for us. If we put into practice the teachings of Romans 14 and 15 with endurance, not growing weary in these hard times. There is no reason we shouldn't have hope that we can stay unified and that God will be glorified and that our community will be able to see and experience the gospel. And that's a hope I'm trusting in, that we can do that as a church. We got to do it together. Let's pray. May you, God, the endure with endurance and the God of encouragement, may you grant us to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus that together we may with one voice glorify you, our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for taking the time to come this morning. Thanks for listening. I'm hoping the Holy Spirit's working in all of us. I trust that he is. Um, have conversations with this. I, lo- I love to hear conversations happening of like where you fall on different opinions as you help each other live in harmony with one another. Kids, I'd love to see your tracking. I'm curious how many times I said gospel and how many times I said unity. Oh, just add one more tab right there to each one. Uh, And uh, you guys all have a great week.